स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's now solve a few problems. The first problem is to show that in the punctured complex plane C minus zero, if you consider any closed uh, curve, it can be homotoped to a closed curve whose image is contained in the unit circle. Let me write that down. Problem one is the following. Let omega be equal to c minus zero, and uh, gamma from a b to omega be a closed curve. Prove that there exists. a curve sigma such that a closed curve sigma sigma such that gamma is homotopic as closed curves to sigma and the image of sigma is contained in s1 s1 recall is the unit circle the set of all complex numbers z so that absolute value of z is equal to 1 let's give a solution to this this is quite straightforward we already start off with uh, gamma which is a closed curve in omega and because omega is c minus 0 it means that gamma of t is not equal to 0 uh, for every t in ab so let's define sigma of t to be equal to gamma of t by the absolute value of gamma of t and uh, notice that because uh, gamma of t is not equal to 0 this makes complete sense and it's also a continuous function from ab uh, into omega in particular if you look at the absolute value of sigma t for any t that's going to be equal to 1 so this is indeed a curve which is contained in s1 and it's a simple check to see that sigma of a this is equal to gamma of a by the absolute value of gamma of a but gamma is a closed curve and therefore this is equal to gamma of b by absolute value of gamma of b which is equal to sigma of t and therefore what do we have we have that sigma is a closed curve with its image contained in s1 of course we have not proved uh, anything about gamma being homotopic to sigma but we will do that in a minute by explicitly defining what the homotopy is we will in fact mimic the homotopy that was given when we proved that any two curves from a point z0 to z1 uh, will be homotopic to each other if the curves are contained in Uh, if the if the domain is convex to begin with remember that there was a straight line homotopy and that's exactly what we will be doing here as well so define h from 0 1 cross ab into omega given by h of um, s comma t this is equal to 1 minus s times gamma of t plus s times sigma of t i'll in fact leave the entire process of checking that h is indeed a, a homotopy of closed curves from gamma to sigma as an exercise to you maybe it's uh, maybe i'll just check for you that h of s comma a this is going to be equal to uh, 1 minus s times gamma of a plus s times sigma of a but then gamma of a is the same as gamma of b and sigma of a is also the same as sigma of b so this is going to be equal to 1 minus s times 
gamma of b plus s times sigma of b. We have already checked that sigma of a is the same as sigma of b. It's a closed curve. And this is precisely equal to h of s comma b. Therefore, at every stage s, h of s comma t or gamma s, gamma subscript s t, that's going to be a closed curve at the point h of s comma i. So this is indeed a closed curve at every stage and uh, the fact that it is continuous is quite straightforward. h0 uh, comma t will just turn out to be equal to gamma of t and h of 1 comma t is just going to be equal to sigma of t. So I gave an entire proof of the fact that h is indeed a uh, homotopy of uh, gamma to sigma homotopy as closed curves from gamma to sigma. And with this we conclude the problem. Let us now use the power of Cauchy's theorem to compute certain integrals which otherwise is uh, difficult to compute. So, let me write it down. Uh, compute the indefinite integral uh, 0 to infinity of cos of t square dt. At first glance, it might look like uh, this has nothing to do with what we are doing what we have been doing in this week, but let us see how uh, Cauchy's theorem comes in to our rescue. It is actually quite magical the way we can use it. So, notice that uh, cos of t square is the real part of e to the power i t square and therefore, uh, okay, before that 0 to infinity cos of t square dt, this is just limit as r goes to infinity of 0 to r cos of t square dt by the very definition. And cos of t square as I have already noted is just the real part of e to the power i t square. So, we will focus on computing e to the power i t square dt. Let us now draw the complex in the complex plane what we are trying to do. We have 0 here and we have an r here and uh, if we look at gamma uh, 1 of t to be equal to t for a t in 0 comma capital R, then integral of e to the power i z square dz over gamma, this is just going to be equal to integral 0 to r e to the power i t square dt by a change of variable which we have discussed uh, in the last week. So, this is precisely what will manifest as integral of uh, 0 to r of e to the power i t square dt. That means, let me draw uh, in red the path along which we are computing the integral. But then our domain is if you think of uh, e to the power i z square that is an entire function, it is holomorphic on the entire complex plane and the entire complex plane is a convex set. And therefore, if you look at the integral of uh, f from along gamma 0 which is a path from z 0 to z 1 and if we manage to get hold of gamma 1 another path from z 0 to z 1 then the integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as the integral f over f over gamma 1. And we are precisely going to do that. We will get an alternate path from 0 to r over which it is easy to uh, compute this limit and approximate. And in order to do that, let us look at uh, the following path, the path at an angle of pi by 4 and followed by the orange path which is the unit, which is the portion of the unit, no, not unit circle, circle of radius r. So, let me write the things down. This is say pi by 4 and uh, suppose if you look at this as the direction and uh, suppose this is the direction of the second curve. So, let, let me write them down. Let gamma 1 of t, so this is gamma 1 and this is gamma 2 
Oh, gamma one has already been taken. So let's call these things something else. Let's call this gamma two, and let's call the third one as the gamma two of t equal to uh, t times e to the power i pi by four, where t is in the interval zero to r. So if you notice, the starting point is the origin. The it's a straight line in the direction of uh, e uh, to the power i pi by four, and it ends at r into e to the power i pi by four. This is exactly the point r into e to the power i pi by four. Okay, and how about gamma three? Gamma three of t be equal to r e to the power i t for t in zero to pi by four. So if you notice. This is exactly the gamma three that we have described. Described gamma two of zero is this point, and uh, gamma two of pi by four is going to be r e to the power i by four. So yes, we have obtained the right parameterizations that we are interested in to compute uh, integral of gamma one. Let's see integral of so basically uh, gamma two. Plus minus of gamma three. Let's have a look at the image that we have drawn here. Gamma two plus minus of gamma three in the other direction. That is going to be the concatenation of these two curves. Is going to be uh, a curve from zero to r. And by Cauchy's theorem. On the domain. Complex plane itself, integral of f of z dz over gamma one. This is equal to the integral of gamma two plus minus of gamma three f of z dz. And let's focus on integral of gamma two plus minus gamma three f of z dz. This is equal to integral over gamma two of f of z dz. Minus the integral over gamma three of f of z dz. This is precisely what we are going to get. And now let's use the parameterization to and the change of variable to say that this is equal to integral of what was gamma two. Recall that gamma two was uh, t times e to the power i pi by four. And what was f of z? F of z was e to the power i z square. Let me just go back, go up, and show you what f was. F was e to the power i z square, and gamma two is t times e to the power i pi by four. So this is going to be e to the power i times gamma of t, which is t e to the power i pi by four square, and uh, Gamma prime t dt. Gamma prime t is just e to the power i pi by four dt. So that's precisely what we will be getting from zero to r. That is the first integral. And how about the second integral? The second integral is uh, e to the power uh, i z square. Z square. Now gamma three. Let's see what gamma three is. Gamma three is r e to the power I t for t in zero to two pi, r e to the power i t square times r into i into the e to the power i t dt. That is precisely gamma prime t dt. So I am freely using whatever theory we have developed till now and writing the expressions down here. Uh, this is equal to integral from zero to r e to the power it will be minus. Uh, one because i into i e to the power i pi by four the whole square is e to the power i pi by two. I'll just leave it to you to check that this is going to be e to the power minus t square, and e to the power i pi by four is just going to be uh, one plus i by root two t t. And how about the second term? This is just going to be zero to pi by four e to the power i r square e to the power two i t. Into r i e to the power i t dt. Okay, now we are interested in the limit as r goes to infinity. So let's see what happens to each of these terms when r goes to infinity. Now limit as r goes to infinity of zero to r 
or maybe I should write 1 plus i by root 2 times integral 0 to r e to the power minus of t square dt which is going to be equal to 1 plus i by root 2 times 0 to infinity e to the power minus t square dt. What is that e to the power minus t square dt is the standard Gaussian integral in fact minus infinity to infinity would have been the uh, Gaussian integral but we know from the Gaussian integral that this is equal to 1 plus i by root 2 times root pi by 2. That is precisely the limit as r goes to infinity of the first term. So, this is something which has been taken care of. Now, let us focus on the second term. The second term is the absolute value from 0 to pi by 4 uh, e to the power i r square e to the power 2 i t. I think I am right here. i r square e to the power 2 i t, correct? r into i into e to the power i t dt limit as r goes to infinity. This is what we are interested in. Uh, Let us try to give, so notice that even though there are uh, complex terms in the interior, uh, in the integrand, the absolute value if you look at uh, the integral 0 to pi by 4 e to the power i r square 2 e to the power 2 i t into r i e to the power i t dt, even if we uh, look at this particular integral after writing it in terms of the real part and the imaginary part, we will be able to treat these as uh, Riemann integrals of real valued functions on 0 to pi by 4. And from real analysis, we know that if you look at the absolute value of the integral of f of t dt, that is less than or equal to the integral of absolute value of f of t dt. This is all from a first question real analysis that we will be using. Using that, one can conclude that even for this Riemann integral, even though there are complex numbers in, involved, one can indeed compute. That is an exercise for you to conclude that this is less than or equal to e to the power i r square e to the power 2 i t into r i e to the power i t dt. This is something which we can conclude. And uh, this is less than or equal to i into e to the power i t has absolute value 1. This is r times is less than or equal to 0 to pi by 4. We will just extract the, uh, the, the absolute value here. Then we will be able to say what is this? This is equal to cos 2t plus i sin 2t. The cos 2t term will not contribute to the absolute value. It will be just be uh, modulus 1 and what will we have? We will have e to the power the absolute value of e to the power which is actually positive minus of r square sin 2t dt. This is precisely what uh, we will be able to conclude here. This in turn is less than or equal to in the interval 0 to 2 pi we can bound our function sin 2 t as well and we can say that this is less than or equal to r square t dt which we will be able to say as being equal to r into uh, r by minus of 1 by r square e to the power minus r square t related from 0 to pi by 4 which is equal to 1 by r times 1 minus e to the power minus r square times pi by 4. E to the power minus r square times pi by 4 is a uh, uh, number with between 0 and 1 and therefore this is in particular less than or equal to 1 by r. So, what have we concluded? We have concluded that the absolute value here is less than or equal to 1 by r and therefore the limit as r goes to infinity will be less than or equal to the limit as r goes to infinity here and hence limit as r goes to infinity of integral over gamma 3 of e to the power z square dz is equal to 0. So, the second term does not contribute. Let me go up and see. So, this is going to be 0. So, let us go up again and check what happened. This term vanishes. We have computed what this term is and we have seen that this is equal to this particular term, the integral of f of z dz over gamma. 
So, in particular, what we have computed is the following we have proved that n's integral e to the power i z square dz over uh, 0 to over gamma or maybe 0 to infinity of this, this is equal to 1 plus i by root 2 times root pi by 2. Therefore, integral of cos t square dt from 0 to infinity, this is equal to root pi phi 2 root 2. So is the case with integral 0 to infinity sin uh, t square dt. So we have computed the integral. Let us do one more problem where we do such contour shifting to conclude something about certain integrals which might be otherwise difficult to handle. So, problem 3 prove that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the power minus of x plus i alpha the whole square dx this is equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus of x square dx, which we know is equal to root of pi. So, the point is to show that the integral on the left does not depend on alpha. All right, let us prove it. So, what is the left hand side minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus of x plus i alpha the whole square dx. This is what we would like to co compute and this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of integral from minus r to r e to the power minus of x plus i alpha the whole square dx. So, let us again draw a picture on the complex plane as to what we would like to do. The green curve is where we would like to compute our uh, integral over. So, let us call this gamma 1 and let the uh, red curve denote minus of r plus i alpha to r plus i alpha. The straight line joining minus of r plus i alpha to r plus i alpha. Let us call this gamma 3 and let us connect by using say pink these two and the turn it into a rectangle and let us call this gamma 2 and let us call this gamma 3. So, let us now convert our uh, real integral, integral which is uh, Riemann integral uh, of real valued functions. Of course, there is an i featuring in here, but by looking at the real part and the imaginary part separately, this is just a real analysis problem. But let us convert it into a problem here by introducing the following. Consider the function f of z to be equal to e to the power minus of z square. And then, if you look at uh, e to the power minus z square that is a function which is holomorphic in the entire complex plane in particular it is an entire function and again complex plane is a convex set. So, we can apply Cauchy's theorem freely or in this case we could apply Cauchy Gursa a special case of Cauchy Gursa rather maybe you can connect the diagonal like this consider this rectangle this triangle and this triangle and notice that the integral of uh, the triangle, the first triangle which is the sum of the integral over this straight line followed by this straight line followed by this straight line and the integral of the second uh, triangle which is this straight line followed by this straight line and this straight line. When you add it up, the integral over this uh, diagonal cancels of each other and we get the integral over the bigger rectangle and both the smaller triangles the integral was 0 and therefore the integral over the 
rectangle will also be 0. Many times this uh, integral over the rectangle being 0 is what is called the cauchy gursa theorem. Now, if you parameterize these curves gamma, so let us see gamma 1 of t is just equal to um, t where t belongs to minus r comma r. Let us now look at what would be the integral of the function f of z over each of these curves and uh, try to see how we can relate it to our problem in hand. So, integral of f of z dz over gamma 1, let us first explore that, that is going to be equal to integral of e to the power minus z square, this is going to be e to the power minus t square dt from minus r to r. This is precisely what integral over gamma 1 is going to be. If you notice that is the thing uh, returned to the, the limit as r goes to infinity is what is written to the right here. Integral over gamma 2 f of z dz, okay, what is gamma 2? Gamma 2 of t that is the straight line path which connects r to r plus i alpha. So, this is just going to be equal to r plus i t where t belongs to 0 comma alpha. So, this will be equal to f of z is e to the power minus z square and that is going to be e to the power minus of r plus i t the whole square which is going to be r square minus t square plus 2 i r t and then gamma prime t is just going to be equal to uh, i dt. This is what we will be getting for gamma 2. So, if you now take the absolute value that is going to be equal to the absolute value here and by a very similar argument uh, as given earlier, this is just a Riemann integral of the imaginary part and the, uh, the real part and that by using a theorem from the first course on real analysis is going to be less than or equal to 0 to alpha the absolute value of whatever is inside which is going to be e to the power minus r square minus t square dt. Notice that t is t square is going to be less than or equal to alpha square. So, notice again that alpha is not necessarily a positive number alpha o oh, I did not write that in the problem for all alpha in r we have not put any restriction on alpha being just a positive number alpha could be any real number this is true. So, the figure that we have drawn might not be representative, it could have been the case that the gamma 3 is uh, in the lower half plane rather than in the upper half plane. However, whatever conclusion is being drawn here that is going to be right. So, if alpha is actually a negative number, the uh, curve gamma 2 would be r plus i t where t is from alpha to 0 because alpha is a negative number. So, we would still have uh, similar uh, similar uh, uh, equality here except that the integral will be from alpha to 0 here instead of 0 to alpha, but the for the sake of uh, absolute value it should not matter. And because uh, t belongs to either 0 alpha or alpha comma 0, t square is certainly going to be less than alpha square. And because of that this is less than or equal to 0 to alpha uh, for all t in 0 alpha in this case and if alpha is negative it is alpha 0. This is less than or equal to e to the power minus of r square minus alpha square dt which is less than or equal to alpha e to the power alpha square by e to the power r square and if you take the limit as r goes to 0 this goes to 0 as r converges to infinity. So, the integral of f over gamma 2 that is converging to 0 as r goes to 0. Similarly, the integral over this was gamma 2, this was gamma 2. Similarly, integral over gamma 3 is also going to be 0, very similar computation will tell us that. Integral f of z dz over gamma 3, not gamma 3, gamma 4 converges to 0 as uh, r goes to infinity. So, let us now only worry about uh, we have taken care of gamma 1, we have taken care of gamma 2, we have also taken care of 
So I've taken care of gamma 1, gamma 2 and gamma 4. So this should have been 4. We have taken care of this as well. Let us now worry about gamma 3. What is the integral of f of z dz over gamma 3? What is gamma 3? We would rather uh, conclude the result over minus of gamma 3. Gamma 3 would be in this direction. Let us see what minus of gamma 3 is. The reversal. We will we'll try to find out what this is. Let minus of gamma 3 of t, this be, this is a map from minus of r plus uh, i alpha to r plus i alpha. So, let us define it to be t plus i alpha where t belongs to minus r comma r. And by substituting it e to the power minus uh, z square, that is what we are interested in. This is going to be equal to integral e to the power um, minus of t plus i alpha the whole square dt from minus r to r. And if we take limit as r goes to infinity of integral over minus gamma 3 of f of z dz that is precisely equal to integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus of let me just do a change of variables here and write it as dx. Okay, now let us go up and apply Cauchy's theorem or Cauchy Gursa to this particular setup by Gursa's theorem or Cauchy Gursa's theorem. We have integral of f over gamma 1 plus integral of f over gamma 2 plus integral of f over gamma 3 plus integral of f over gamma 4 is equal to 0. And as r goes to infinity, this vanishes and this vanishes. And therefore, we have integral of gamma 1 plus integral of gamma 3 is equal to 0 by Cauchy Gursa we have integral of f of z dz over gamma 1 plus integral f of z dz over gamma 3 is equal to 0 as r goes to infinity. And therefore, integral of f of z dz over gamma 1 is equal to minus of integral of f of z dz over gamma 3 which is the same as integral over minus gamma 3 the reversal of f of z dz and we have explicitly computed both these numbers uh, both both these quantities the right hand side is going to be e to the power integral of e to the power minus of uh, x plus i alpha the whole square dx from minus infinity to infinity. And this is going to be integral e to the power minus of x square dx from minus infinity to infinity. That is precisely what we had set out to do. In the next problem, we will address the question of existence of an inverse to the exponential function. Classically, this is what is called as the logarithm in real analysis, but we have not defined uh, an analog of the logarithm for complex numbers. So, in this problem, we will be addressing one such uh, question. Problem 4. Let omega be a simply connected domain. Recall that a domain is simply connected if for every closed curve at a point z0 is null homotopic to the constant curve at z0. Suppose omega is a simply connected domain and f be a map, holomorphic map on omega into c minus 0 such that f of z is not equal to 0. And let us put one more uh, condition that f prime is also holomorphic. So, I would like to uh, mention at this point that this is a redundant condition which we will be proving very shortly. If f is holomorphic, we will be able to show that f prime is also holomorphic. So, I did not uh, have to put this condition into the hypothesis of this problem, but as of now we have not proved that f 
uh, is holomorphic implies f prime is holomorphic. So let me just put that into the hypothesis here. So this is for all z in omega. Okay. Then there exists g from omega into c such that f of z is equal to the exponential of g of z. Notice that if omega is a is such a domain which does not contain the origins, it is a simply connected domain which does not contain the origin and if we consider the identity map f of z is equal to z then in particular that is a holomorphic function and uh, the conclusion tells us that we will be able to get hold of a function g which will behave like the logarithm such that exponential of g of z is equal to z. So this is in some sense uh, the extension of the classical logarithm which is defined on the positive real numbers. Let us give a proof of this, the proof is quite straightforward. Now that we have the uh, tool of Cauchy's theorem at our disposal, this can be proved quite easily. Consider the function f of f prime of z by f of z. Notice that f of z does not vanish in omega. For every z in omega, f of z is not equal to 0. So 1 by f of z is a holomorphic function or in particular f prime by f of z is a holomorphic function is holomorphic on omega. What do we know about omega? And by applying Cauchy's theorem to simply connected domains, we can say that every holomorphic function defined on a simply connected domain has an antiderivative. So since omega is simply connected, there exists an antiderivative g of z such that uh, g prime of z is equal to f prime of z by f of z. Now let us consider uh, the function g. g is uh, basically or rather let us define h of z to be equal to the exponential of g of z. We know that g is a holomorphic function, we also know that exponential is a holomorphic function, composition of holomorphic functions is going to be a holomorphic function and we also know that exponential does not vanish, therefore h is a function which does not vanish on omega and is holomorphic on omega. Let us consider f by h and look at its derivative. The derivative by quotient rule is going to be equal to f prime times h minus f times h prime by h square and if you notice f prime times h minus uh, f times h prime this is going to be equal to f prime times uh, what is h? h is going to be exponential of g of z uh, minus f times the exponential of g of z times g prime of z and g prime of z is going to be f prime by f. So the f's will cancel off here and we get that this is equal to 0. This is the case on omega. And therefore, we have f prime or rather f by h prime. This function is 0 on omega. That means by elementary calculus, we can conclude that f is equal to a constant times h. Now, that means that i e f of z is equal to uh, c times the exponential of g of z. Let c prime be some number such that e to the power c prime is equal to c, then we have f of z is equal to the exponential of g of z plus c prime. That is precisely, so we will call this new function as g and that is precisely what we were trying to find out. We have a function g such that exponential of g in this case, let me in that case do one thing, call this g0, just change the notation above as well. Let g0 be this function uh, 
all right so this define g of z to be equal to g0 of z plus c prime and that's the function we were looking for let me stop here